What's poppin' webheads? It's me, MT, and welcome to the Heavy Spoiler Show. I am super happy to be back collaborating with the spectacular spoiler man himself, Paul Spoilers, on yet another super fun Marvel breakdown. And this time, let's do a breakdown of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, shall we? This movie is finally available on digital, after all, so we've got to appreciate this masterpiece of art just one more time. And right away, as the opening production credits roll before the movie even starts, audiences should be able to hear a mysterious coughing noise. This cough is actually the cough of one of the writers slash producers of Across the Spider-Verse, Christopher Miller. Producers Christopher Miller and Phil Lord have been sneaking in Miller's cough at the beginning of all of their films since 22 Jump Street, which means the cough has even been included in their last Spider-Verse movie, as well as their recent original animated film, The Mitchells vs. The Machines. Anyways, as the Sony Pictures animation logo starts to glitch out, we can see the logos turn into the design styles of popular Spider-Man comics. For example, this Sony logo appears to be a reference to Miles Morales' Ultimate Spider-Man comics. This Sony logo looks like a Julia Carpenter Spider-Woman logo from 1993. This Sony Pictures animation logo looks like an early Spider-Ham comic cover. This Sony Pictures animation logo looks like the cover to Secret Wars number 8. And this Sony Pictures animation logo is a shout out to the Amazing Spider-Man 300, which of course is the first appearance of Venom. A super subtle but nice touch by the animation team for hardcore comic book fans to appreciate. And just like in Into the Spider-Verse, the movie does not show us a single moment of action Action without letting us know that this movie has been given the Comics Code Authority stamp of approval. And for those of you who don't know, the Comics Code Authority was established in 1954 to monitor the quality of comic books being distributed to impressionable children. You know, to make sure that there wasn't an excess of inappropriate things like horror, violence, and Lord have mercy, female cleavage. I mean, God forbid a comic book nerd see the top of a titty in 1954. But I am so amped that they decided to bring this little joke back for the top of the second movie because it really shows that everybody involved in this movie is deeply invested in making sure that this movie feels just as much of a Marvel comic book in motion like Into the Spider-Verse was. So having this right at the beginning feels like we're about to start a whole new comic book issue, filled with little editor's note boxes scattered throughout and everything. But anyways, as Gwen Stacy beats her frustrations out on the drum set of the Mary Janes, the movie opens up with visuals of key moments from Into the Spider-Verse, while also showing us quick glimpses towards future events of this film. You know, like Gwen Stacy seeing Spider-Man 2099 for the first time, Captain George Stacy pointing a gun at his daughter, Miguel teaching Miles about canon events, Miles spying on Gwen while invisible, Gwen using her webs to try to stop Miles, Gwen being sent away in the go home machine, and even Gwen spying on Miles' parents at the end of the film. But one super important thing that you might miss that this intro reveals is that somebody seemingly used a pair of tweezers to pick up the spider from Earth-42 that bit Miles Morales, with that certain somebody being revealed later on as Dr. Jonathan Ahn, who becomes Miles' main nemesis, The Spot. As we can see, that same dead Earth-42 spider amongst The Spot's collection of multiversal mutant spiders in his apartment later on in the film, a collection that also includes spiders from Earth-19725, from Spider-Girl The End Number 1, Spider-Man Noir's world of Earth-90214, a different spider from Penny Parker's Earth-14512, and a spider from Earth-333 that seemingly escaped. Spot's apartment also has a special multiversal phone number on the side, the number 1917-1610, 616, with one, of course, being the area code for North America, 917 being the area code for New York City, and 1610 and 616 being a reference to Miles' home universe of 1610 and Peter B. Parker's 616 universe. Anyways, the movie begins with us on Earth 65's version of Chelsea, New York, with the 65 and Earth 65 being a direct reference to the year 1965, which is the year Gwen Stacy first appeared in Marvel Comics in The Amazing Spider-Man number 31. Gwen Stacy engages in and enrages at band practice with her soon-to-be former band, the Mary Janes, consisting of three major women in Peter Parker's life in the comics. Mary Jane Watson on vocals, Betty Brant on piano, and Gloria Grant on guitar. Both Betty and Gloria have both worked as Jameson's secretaries at the Daily Bugle in the main Spider-Man comics, but all four of them appear to be practicing for a concert inside of a Visions Academy auditorium, as a sports banner from the 90s can be seen hanging in the background. 
But I especially love how one of Gwen's bandmates calls Gwen Def Leopard, like D-E-A-F, Def, as Gwen absentmindedly drums her feelings away. Because not only is this a reference to the 1970s rock band Def Leopard, but it is exactly what one of Gwen's bandmates says when Gwen first is introduced in her first appearance in 2014's Edge of the Spider-Verse number two. This exact same thing happens with Gwen and her band in the opening of that issue, just like it does in the opening of Across the Spider-Verse, including Gwen experiencing flashbacks as she drums. I really did think that starting Spider-Verse 2 with a tribute to Spider-Gwen's first comic was extremely clever here. But I personally have a special attachment to Earth-65, specifically because of the art style of this universe, and how this specific watercolor art style is how I personally first got into comics in 2015. Artist Robbie Rodriguez's incredible cover art for Spider-Gwen's first solo issues are what led me to buy my first ever Marvel comic as an adult. And those very Spider-Gwen comics are what fostered my deep love of comic books today. So getting to witness Across the Spider-Verse bring Rodriguez's art to life for Earth-65's watercolor aesthetic has been deeply satisfying to me as a comic book YouTuber today. Especially how this movie likes to use red for people in Gwen's life that she grows resentment towards. Like the movie does first with the Mary Janes when Gwen gets mad at them, and then soon after with Captain Stacy when they get into an argument. All while Gwen is painted in a blue hue to represent how Gwen's inner feelings of loneliness and powerlessness are fueling her cold nature towards the people that she loves. And I really do appreciate that splash and bleed of purple when Gwen gives her dad a hug right before he heads off to confront the vulture at the Guggenheim because it shows those two conflicting colors coming together. But anyways, as Gwen experiences a flashback to a Stacy family dinner with her version of Peter Parker, we can see Captain George Stacy and Peter Parker disagree on their opinions of the mass spider vigilante of New York, which bears a lot of similarities to when Andrew Garfield Spider-Man had a family dinner disagreement with Captain Stacy in The Amazing Spider-Man 1. But as the flashback continues, we can see that an Earth-65 variant of Ned Leeds bullies Peter Parker, which then pushes Peter to want to become a strong superhuman like Gwen by taking the lizard serum, which strongly mirrors what happens to Earth-65 Peter Parker during Spider-Gwen's origin story in The Edge of the Spider-Verse number two. But also, if you think about it, knowing that Ned Leeds is what causes Peter Parker to turn into the lizard and be killed, it's a lot different after MCU Ned Leeds made that promise to never hurt Peter in Spider-Man No Way Home. However, with Ned Leeds' comic book history as the Hobgoblin, him being at odds with Peter Parker seems more likely than not in the grand scheme of the multiverse. I also found it quite sad how Peter Parker knew Gwen was Spider-Woman and wanted to see her face before he died, because it reminded me a lot of the same pain Insomniac Spider-Man had to face when Aunt May wanted to see his face before she died. But anyways, as newsreels of Captain George Stacy hunting down Spider-Woman begin to play, we can hear J.K. Simmons returning to his role as J. Jonah Jameson once again, making this Earth-65 variant the third version of Jameson J.K. Simmons has played in his film career, which is quite crazy. And when Gwen gets home and has her first tense moment with her dad in her bedroom, you can see a tiny little frame in her room that says, need more punk, which both acts as a way for Gwen to express her love for punk rock, but also as a clever piece of foreshadowing to how she will inevitably run away from home to live with Spider-Punk for a short while. Gwen also has a poster that says protect trans kids in her room, which is deeply reflective of Gwen's responsible and compassionate personality, while also being very thematically fitting, as the colors of the trans flag match the three main bright colors of Spider-Gwen's suit. Also, if you look at George Stacy's shirt, you can see that he's wearing a very large and faded Visions Academy gymnastics shirt, which I thought was a really nice way to show how deeply George Stacy loves his daughter and supports her hobbies like gymnastics. A hobby that we see in full effect as Gwen gracefully swings over to confront a vulture from a Leonardo da Vinci style universe by the name of Adriano Tumino the Italian Renaissance version of Adrian Toomes. This alternate universe vulture's art style was apparently deeply inspired by the 15th century artwork within Leonardo da Vinci's Codex Atlanticus. And considering how Adrian Toomes has always had a love for inventing in the comics, a da Vinci vulture variant is an insanely clever design choice in my opinion. Adriana Tumino, of course, looks drastically different from the vulture native to Earth-65, who we can see Captain George Stacy glancing at a file of 
before he enters the Guggenheim Museum. The Adrian tombs pictured in the file looks like a faithful recreation of the Earth-65 Adrian tombs from the comics, the very first villain that Spider-Gwen faces off against in her first solo series. And a little later, we learn from Spider-Man 2099 Miguel O'Hara that this Renaissance Vulture variant only showed up in Earth-65 in large part to Gwen and Miles Morales' actions at the Alchemax Super Collider at the end of Into the Spider-Verse, as that explosion has caused sizable tears within the Spider-Verse that random Spider-Man characters and villains started falling into. And seeing as Miguel directly mentions MCU Spider-Man and Doctor Strange by name, soon after he blames Gwen and Miles for tearing the holes in the Spider-Verse, it's looking very likely to me that this Renaissance Da Vinci Vulture, along with the other Spider-Society prisoners like MCU Prowler probably fell in one of the Super Collider holes during their return trip following Doctor Strange's final No Way Home spell. This would also explain why MCU Vulture is now in Sony's Venom universe as well. It seems like the multiversal consequences of both Spider-Man No Way Home and Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse working together is what is causing all of this mayhem that Miguel is super annoyed about. But speaking of Miguel, let's talk about Spider-Man 2099, the spider that Gwen refers to as the Blue Panther, the Caped Blue Seder, Dark Garfield, and Macho Libre, which are references to Black Panther, the Caped Crusader, Garfield the Cat, and Jack Black's Nacho Libre, because he looks like a wrestler. A spider who enters the scene with a cape that he only likes to put on for dramatic effect. But no, seriously, why even have the cape if you are never going to wear it? But anyways, in the comics, Miguel O'Hara gets his spider powers in a very unique way compared to spiders like Peter Parker or Miles Morales. In Miguel's first appearance in 1992's Spider-Man 2099 number one, we learn that Miguel O'Hara is a wildly intelligent genetic scientist who was working at Alchemax when one of his angry co-workers tried to kill him by overloading a machine meant to graft spider DNA onto human DNA. And because of this, Miguel developed the proportional strength and agility of a spider along with crazy sharp teeth and retractable talons on his fingers and toes. Features that we see best when Miguel is about to take a massive bite out of the vulture's face in front of a bunch of witnesses. I really do love this frame of Miguel baring his teeth at Vulture as it appears to be a direct reference to the final page of his first appearance in the comics. So having him bare his teeth during his first appearance in the movie was super fitting. However, one thing that most viewers don't really consider is how much Miguel's proficiency in the field of genetics and technology is the main reason why he was the one to form Spider Society and no one else. Because as we learn in Into the Spider-Verse, one of the key components needed to be able to find other variants throughout the multiverse is that person's DNA. So just like Kingpin and Dr. Octavius used DNA from his dead wife and son to try to find variants of them, Miguel O'Hara used his genetic and technological know-how to develop all the Spider-Verse watches for Spider Society, as well as the creepy go home machine that would inevitably send Miles Morales to Earth 42 by locking onto his spider's genetic signature. Miguel is also able to shoot organic webbing out of his wrist in the comics, much like Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man can. However, in Across the Spider-Verse, it appears that he mainly uses a futuristic web shooter from the year 2099. Futuristic webs that apparently can zigzag towards their target, much like Darkseid's Omega Beams. However, one of the most important things that separates Spider-Man 2099 from other spiders in the Spider-Verse is that while his reflexes and eyesight are indeed insane, Miguel O'Hara does not possess a cosmic spider sense, as we can see demonstrated when Miguel doesn't see Vulture's attack from behind coming, while Spider-Gwen most certainly did. If I were to guess, Miguel's lack of a spider sense is likely tied to him not being directly bitten by a spider during his origin. There appears to be a difference between getting spider DNA via a machine versus getting mutated spider DNA directly from a spider bite. However, we can't talk about Spider-Man 2099 without talking about his handy dandy AI assistant, Lila, who, much like Miguel, is returning to the Spider-Verse franchise since the last time we saw her pop up in the post credit scene. Lila's name is actually an acronym that stands for Lyrate Lifeform Approximation, as that is the type of futuristic AI that Lila is in the comics. And much like Cortana helps out Master Chief in the Halo series, Lila is Miguel's AI companion as he goes throughout his hero business throughout the multiverse. And though Lila's movie design drastically differs from her Marilyn Monroe inspired designs in the comics, she does appear to share comic Lila's very human-like personality despite being an AI. And we can see movie Lila's unique personality shine best 
as she teases Miguel into admitting that he needs backup, before revealing that she went behind his back and called for backup anyway. So Lila appears to have a special autonomy that most fictional AI do not have. But actually, fun fact about that specific moment between Lila and Miguel, because apparently a bunch of eagle-eyed Spider-Verse fans on the internet discovered that Lila uses completely different animations to tease Miguel depending on what version of the movie that you're watching. For example, one version of the movie has Lila taking a selfie using a bunny ears filter on Miguel, and another version has her teasing him without a virtual phone. To fit the multiverse theme of the movie, it appears that Sony Pictures have released a number of very slightly different versions of Across the Spider-Verse to theaters. The differences are super subtle, but spectacular spider heads like Reddit user Ho 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 You have compiled a list of all of those differences that we will briefly flash on the screen now. Take it in. Take it in good. You're doing the Spider Lord's work, you ho 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 you. But anyways, when backup finally arrives, it comes in the form of a very pregnant Jessica Drew Spider-Woman as played by Insecure's Issa Rae, a version of Spider-Woman that Gwen Stacy looks up to a lot like Miles Morales looked up to both versions of Peter Parker in Into the Spider-Verse. And though the character of Jessica Drew was first introduced as Spider-Woman in 1977's Marvel 2-in-1 number 29, her design appears to be heavily inspired by Marvel's actual first Spider-Woman, Valerie the Librarian, who donned the Spider-Woman mantle three years before Jessica Drew in 1974's Spidey Super Stories number 1. Spider-Woman's pregnancy in the movie is of course inspired by Dennis Halem's iconic Spider-Woman run from 2015 where Jessica Drew fights crime while mega preggers. Including a pregnant Spider-Woman in Across the Spider-Verse was a phenomenal way for this movie to drive home the main theme of the series that anybody can wear the mask, no matter what your circumstances may be. Like one of the best things about Across the Spider-Verse is how it is one big celebration of diversity. So having a black and pregnant Spider-Woman is spectacular representation for people who can identify with one or both of these experiences. Because strong black and or pregnant women are a rare sight to see leading a comic book movie on the big screen. But anyways, after Gwen, Miguel, and Jess stop Leonardo da Vulture's rampage while also saving a museum goer who is dressed like the Riddler for some reason, Gwen reveals her secret identity to her father before being recruited to join Miguel's multiverse spider team, very much mirroring Spider-Gwen's identity reveal to Captain Stacy in Edge of the Spider-Verse number two, right before Spider-UK recruits her to join the original Spider-Verse team. Also, remember how I was talking about this movie's use of blue and red in relation to Spider-Gwen and the people that she fights with? Notice how Captain Stacy is half red and half blue as he begins to struggle with his sense of duty. I believe they gave Captain Stacy that blue tint to show that he's beginning to understand his daughter's perspective and why Gwen has been acting so strangely. Like this movie's use of the art of the various universes to convey emotion is second to none. Like when the paint in the background appears to cry and bleed as Gwen emotionally reacts to having her father point a gun at her face and frame her for having a weapon that she didn't have. But anyways, after Gwen disappears into the portal, we are then finally brought to Miles Morales' native home of Earth 1610 Brooklyn on Tuesday, July 11th, 2023. Judging by the date on the convenience store security camera anyway. And as of this point, it has been a full two years since the events of the first film, meaning that Miles has a good amount of experience as Spider-Man under his belt. As we can see him punching Hammerhead, a black frogman, which is amazing, Beetle and Grizzly in a flashback sequence that happened much before Miles' fateful trip to the convenience store. A convenience store being robbed by the scientist formerly known as Dr. Jonathan Ahn, The Spot, the main antagonist of the movie. Introducing the pages of 1985's Spectacular Spider-Man 98, The Spot has been one of the most ridiculous looking and underrated Spider-Man villains of all time. So ridiculous that Peter Parker's first reaction when meeting him was to laugh his spider-themed ass off and mock him, much like Miles Morales does when they first face off inside that convenience store. A mocking that the spot deeply takes to heart while plotting his revenge against Miles. We learn later in the movie that Dr. Jonathan Ahn was fired from his job at Alchemax after his body was covered in a bunch of black dark matter spots as a direct consequence to Miles blowing up the super collider at the end of Into the Spider-Verse. And judging by his super messed up apartment that Gwen visits later on in the movie, I can definitely understand why the spot is super pissed at Miles Morales because it seems like he truly loved his job as a dark matter scientist at Alchemax and was sort of excelling at it as evidenced by his Alchemax award for the breakthrough of the year. In fact, according to Justin K. Thompson, one of the directors of Across the Spider-Verse, alongside Ken Powers and Joaquim Dos Santos, the very science of the Super Collider was actually all Dr. On, because Jonathan was always obsessed with the idea 
of mastering the mysteries of dark matter to travel the multiverse. The very same concept that Miles Morales brings up while talking about Princeton University's science program to his parents during their meeting with the guidance counselor. Princeton has the best quantum researchers in the country. Quantum radio. They're moving mm -hmm. electrons across dimensional thresholds. Electrons, uh -huh. I mean, they're studying dark matter. Like Miles' deep desire to see Gwen, Peter, and the rest of his Spider-Verse friends again was driving his desire to go to Princeton. Miles wanted to unlock the secrets of multiverse travel by studying dark matter and quantum physics, just like Jonathan Ahn did. Honestly, if Miles and Jonathan met in another life or another universe, Miles would probably look up to Jonathan a lot, much like both Sam Raimi and PlayStation versions of Peter Parker once revered Dr. Octavius. In fact, if we study the incredible art design that Across the Spider-Verse artist Tiffany Lam did with Spot's apartment, we can see that Jonathan's obsession with using dark matter to travel the multiverse led him to essentially recreate an entire laboratory within this tiny space in his apartment. An apartment filled with books on dark matter, string theory, the multiverse, black holes, gravity, and quantum math and stuff. However, speaking of Doc Ock, despite having done most of the breakthrough science by himself, Jonathan had all of his passionate dark matter science stolen by Dr. Olivia Octavius, who then took most of the credit for the Collider's creation, while leaving Jonathan to fade into the background of Alchemax scientists just waiting to be hit with a bagel by a confused teenager. However, while Spot is talking to himself, while building this mini super collider in his apartment, he mentions needing a little bit more dark energy, which is a really important piece of science in both our real life and the MCU. In fact, it is a concept directly linked to the blue space traveling cosmic energy of the Tesseract. A bunch of MCU scientists like Dr. Selvig were all studying how to unlock the secrets of dark energy under Nick Fury at the Dark Energy Mission Facility at the beginning of Avengers 1. And since the end of Marvel Studios' What If Episode 1 revealed that the dark energy within the Tesseract is directly linked to multiversal travel, it would definitely make sense that dark energy would be needed to make any multiversal super collider work. Anyways, after Miles jumps into the portal after Gwen, we of course find ourselves in Mumbatan on Earth 5101, the home of Pavitra Prabhakar, aka Spider-Man India, a character first introduced in 2005 Spider-Man India number one. In the movie, Earth 5101 is a mishmash of India's Mumbai and New York's Manhattan, with an art style that matches the art found in the Indra Jal comics popular in India in the 1970s, with The Phantom being one of their most popular comics. And much like Peter Parker has a relationship with Gwen Stacy, the daughter of police Captain Stacy in many universes, movie Pravitra has a relationship with Gayatri Singh, the daughter of police Captain Singh in this universe. And while Spider-Man India has only been Spider-Man for around six months, he apparently has already been invited to join Spider Society and has quickly developed a strong kinship with the rebellious Hobie Brown, the anarchic Spider-Man himself known as Spider-Punk. The single most interesting character in this beautiful movie filled with interesting characters. One of my absolute favorite things about Spider-Punk's design in this movie is how he appears to change color based on his mood, with Hobie being fully colored and bright when he's experiencing happiness, love, and satisfaction, like when he hangs out with Gwen and Pravitter, while losing his color completely and turning black and white as he starts to experience darker and more negative emotions, like anger, disappointment, and frustration, like what happens when Hobie is around Miguel or when Hobie is on the elevator, annoyed with Miles for wanting to even meet Miguel. But anyways, though Spider-Punk does hail from Earth-138 in the comics, the original character of Hobie Brown was actually first introduced in comic book Earth-616 as Marvel Comics' first iteration of The Prowler in the pages of 1969's Amazing Spider-Man 78. Marvel then took the character of Hobie Brown and made the alternate universe Spider-Punk in 2014. Though it would seem that Across the Spider-Verse has purposely left the Earth number for Spider-Punk's world a mystery for now, as a lot of information about Spider-Punk's Earth seems to be being saved for Beyond the Spider-Verse for some reason. But we can still definitely see that Spider-Punk's world is inspired by the London punk rock scene of the 70s and 80s, mixed in with some New York City flair. However, one of the few things that we know about Hobie Brown's time in this universe is that he has no love for the oppressive Kingpin. And according to Spider-Verse 2 director Ken Powers, Spider-Punk lives on a canal boat that also doubles as Spider-Punk's secret spider headquarters. However, one of the most surprising things about Spider-Punk in Across the Spider-Verse is that he appears to share a bioelectric power set very similar to Miles Morales. As we can see, an older and more experienced Spider-Punk 
coaching Miles on how to use his whole palm instead of just his fingertips to disable force fields twice over the course of this movie. It appears the implication is that Spider-Punk was likely bitten by a variant of the same spider that bit Miles Morales. And his bioelectric powers are the main reason why Spider-Punk is able to shred an electric guitar without a power source. The electricity running throughout his body is where his guitar is getting all of that juice. Which I thought was a really nice creative decision. However, I truly do believe that there is a deeper meaning here behind Miles using his fingertips versus Hobie Brown using his whole entire hand. As I believe it is meant to symbolize the drastically different approaches that both Miles and Spider-Punk have with how they wield their great power. And these two drastically different approaches could potentially become a major factor in Beyond the Spider-Verse. Miles choosing to have a more delicate and reserved bioelectric touch in comparison, Spider-Punk's more aggressive and destructive application of his powers illustrates just how much force each of these people are willing to use for what they see as the greater good. Miles practices restraint while Hobie is not afraid to aggressively and emotionally use his whole hand to create the reality that he wants to see. And it's these differences that fuels both Miles and Hobie's character dynamic in the film, as Hobie spends a good chunk of his time on screen trying to convince Miles to not enlist in Spider-Man 2099 Spider Army. And simply judging by how much Miguel and Hobie just don't get along, you can tell just how much Hobie hates everything about Miguel's oppressive cosmic cops who love to police the Spider-Verse, just like the TVA policed the sacred timeline in Loki. With Spider-Man 2099 even whipping out the same MCU-inspired multiversal imagery while explaining the structure of the Spider-Verse to Miles. You can definitely tell that Marvel Studios and Sony have a deeper relationship than ever before. And this is why, in my opinion, that Spider-Punk will most likely end up becoming the most dangerous person to the Spider-Verse as we know it in the sequel to this film. Because the very concept of canon events and making sure human beings suffer and die just to fulfill some mysterious entity's grand cosmic plan for the multiverse is something that Spider-Punk cannot and will not stand for. And much like Sylvie plotted to take down the mastermind behind the TVA as soon as she learned that the TVA existed, Spider-Punk has likely been plotting the same exact thing and has even manipulated Gwen Stacy into gathering a spider army by the end of the film to rise up against Miguel and his authoritarian regime. Because that is what Spider-Punk does best. He knows how to build a good army. And because the title of this next film is called Beyond the Spider-Verse, I can also see Spider-Punk going beyond the Spider-Verse to the very end of time itself, finding whatever mysterious great weaver is weaving everyone's fates like a dictator and then killing them. Just like Sylvie killed He Who Remains for doing the exact same thing. Because ever since we learned about Spider-Punk in 2015 Spider-Verse number two, Hobie Brown has always been willing to kill in the name of anarchy. Spider-Punk is a version of Spider-Man whose sense of responsibility is deeply rooted in his dream of freedom for all. And he is more than willing to do whatever it takes to dismantle any oppressive system. Hell, at the end of that same issue, Hobie Brown can be seen publicly executing President Osborn with his guitar. Like, Hobie Brown is built different, and that is the reason why the superior Spider-Man, Otto Octavius, wanted to recruit him as part of his spider army. He is 100% not afraid to kill for what he believes is the greater good. Hobie Brown killing the Great Weaver at the end of time would be a fantastic way to end the Spider-Verse trilogy in preparation to cross over with the MCU. Because if both Sony Spider-Verse and Marvel Studios' sacred timeline start branching out of control, the chances of these two separate multiverses overgrowing and branching into one another to destabilize both multiverses rises significantly, which would then of course lead to MCU incursions with the Spider-Verse, paving the road to secret wars with multiverse mayhem. And that's right y'all, I said two separate multiverses. As of Across the Spider-Verse, it is now officially confirmed that the Marvel Cosmos, including the Marvel Cinematic Universe, is all part of one poly multiverse, as evidenced by Spider-Man 2099 referring to the Spider-Verse as the arachno-humanoid poly multiverse, with poly of course meaning many. This is why Loki gets sent to a completely different TVA at the end of Loki season one, and also why there is no TVA in Sony's Spider-Verse movies. The Spider-Verse appears to be Sony's own unique multiverse of possibilities, a multiverse that used to be completely separate from the MCU until MCU Peter Parker and Doctor Strange goofed up big time and brought a bunch of souls from the Spider-Verse to the MCU multiverse at the very beginning of Spider-Man No Way Home. Doctor Strange tried to send all those anomalies back to their native Spider-Verse multiverse 
with that last memory spell, but it appears that that spell didn't just send those Spider-Verse souls in the sky back to the Spider-Verse, but also accidentally sent MCU native Spider-Man characters like Michael Keaton's Vulture and Donald Glover's Prowler to the Spider-Verse too. Then all of those souls from both multiverses started falling into the tears in reality that Miles and the gang made at the end of Into the Spider-Verse. So it looks like not everyone made it back to their native reality, which is why Spider-Man 29 has a massive prison of anomalies that he's trying to sort back to their native worlds. Anomalies including PlayStation Insomniac's version of Spider-Man from Earth 1048, standing right behind a green pixelated Atari version of Green Goblin on the right, and the blue pixelated Video Man on the left. Video Man made his debut in Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends and had the ability to bring characters from video games to life, which could possibly be the reason how Insomniac Spider-Man got there in the first place, since we do know that PlayStation Spider-Man games actively exist within the Spider-Verse, as Miles' roommate Genki Lee can be seen playing Spider-Man PS5 at the start of the film. But anyways, right before Miles and Gwen meet up with Miguel, they of course run into Margot Kess, the spider bite of Earth 22191, a universe introduced in 2018's Vault of Spiders number one, where everyone spends most of their time in a virtual reality cyberspace, much like in Ready Player One. Spider-Bite fights crime in this virtual cyberspace with her own virtual avatar, though Margot and Miles do appear to share a mysterious cosmic spider bomb that we don't really know about quite yet, as both their spider senses appear to have this weird connection with each other as they first meet. But this is before Miles inevitably catches up with his former mentor, Peter B. Parker of Sony Spider-Verse 616, along with his new baby daughter, Mayday Parker, a baby who has manifested her spider powers within six months of her birth, and even has a fully developed spider sense, which is drastically different than her comic book counterpart, as comic Mayday Parker, who was introduced in 1997's What If 105, did not gain her powers until she was a teenager. But anyways, after the gang catches up, Spider-Man 2099 schools Miles Morales in Canon Events 101, and Miles learns that some mysterious force in the cosmos has written the stories of all the spiders in the Spider-Verse, and that every spider must have certain unchangeable events happen in their lives in order for them to become the heroes they were meant to be. For example, the Canon event that Miguel refers to as ASM 90 dictates that a police captain close to a spider hero has to die trying to save an innocent life. With ASM 90, of course, referring to 1970's Amazing Spider-Man 90, which featured the death of police Captain Stacy. This is why we see images of both Josh Keaton's Spectacular Spider-Man and Andrew Garfield's Amazing Spider-Man both grieving over the loss of their respective Captain Stacy's. But while we have seen Andrew Garfield grieve over Dennis Leary's George Stacy before in the first Amazing Spider-Man, the death of Clancy Brown's George Stacy from the Spectacular Spider-Man cartoon was revealed for the first time in Across the Spider-Verse. If other canon events follow the same ASM 90 trend of being named after Spider-Man comics, the Spider-Man No More canon event that Spider-Punk is looking at would be ASM 50 after the Amazing Spider-Man 50, a Spider-Woman being trapped under rubble would be ASM 33, a Spider-Man getting married to the love of their life would be ASMA 21 after the Amazing Spider-Man Annual 21, and the Uncle Ben death canon event would be AF 15 for Amazing Fantasy 15, which is of course Spider-Man's first ever appearance. And while the Uncle Ben canon event plays out for Miles, we can see Tobey Maguire Peter Parker from Sam Raimi's first Spider-Man film grieve over the loss of Uncle Ben next to images of the spectacular Spider-Man and the video game version of Andrew Garfield's Amazing Spider-Man grieving over Uncle Ben as well. But anyways, it is when Miles starts to reject the Spider Society by running away that the real fun begins because that is when we truly get to see all the incredible diversity that Spider Society has to offer. There are so many different types of spider people in this movie, with most of them being completely original creations for the film. But while close to 100 of these variants are completely new, there are a lot of familiar faces that Spider-Man fans from different mediums will recognize. Familiar faces like fan favorite Ben Riley, the Scarlet Spider, voiced by Andy Samberg, who first appeared in The Amazing Spider-Man 149. Then we have Spider-Man Unlimited from the 1999 cartoon of the same name, the bombastic Bagman who first appeared in The Amazing Spider-Man 258, Charlotte Webber, the Sun Spider from 2019 Spider-Verse number 3, Werewolf Spider-Man from 2007's Marvel Zombies Army of Darkness number 5, Webman from Spidey Super Stories number 25, Spider-Man 2211 Max Born from 1995 Spider-Man 2099 meets Spider-Man number 1, Flash Thompson's 
Captain Spider from 1977's What If Number 7, Lego Spider-Man from Lego Marvel Super Heroes, Lady Spider from 2014's Spider-Verse Number 1, Otto Octavius Superior Spider-Man, who actually became Spider-Man in Spider-Man 697, a Cyborg Spider-Woman based off Cyborg Spider-Man, who debuted in 2014's Superior Spider-Man number 33, a Metro Boomin Spider-Man voiced by rap producer Metro Boomin, who also helped produce the Spider-Verse 2 soundtrack, Peter Parked Carr from 2015's Amazing Spider-Man number 12, Julia Carpenter Spider-Woman from 1984's Secret Wars number 7, Mary Jane Watson Spinnerette, who first adopts the title in 2016's Spider-Man Renew Your Vows number 2, is walking alongside her daughter, Anna Mae Parker, who becomes the Spider-Ling, in 2017's Renew Your Vows number 4. Then we have Web Slinger from 2014's Amazing Spider-Man number 9, riding Widow the Spider Horse from 2015's Amazing Spider-Man number 12. We also got Last Stand Spider-Man from 2003's Spider-Man 58, Mangaverse Spider-Man from Marvel Mangaverse Spider-Man number 1, Spider-Side from Spider-Man 399, and we also got Spider-Cop, a persona that Insomniac Spider-Man invented as an inside joke with a police officer makes an appearance after being made canon in 2018 spider Ganon number 4. But there is also a Spider-Cop very prevalent in the Earth-X series as well. We can also see Spider-Rex from 2022's Edge of the Spider-Verse number 1, Spider-Monkey from Spider-Man Family number 1, Spider-Cat from Spider-Island I Love New York City number 1, the original animated Spider-Man from 1967, who Miguel first recruited in the Into the Spider-Verse post credit scene, the Silver Mark I Armored Spider-Man from Web of Spider-Man number 100, a Black Mark II Spider-Man from Spider-Man 656, and a Red and Black Mark III Spider-Man from Spider-Man 682. And of course, the entire Spider-Gang from the first movie, who Spider-Gren recruits as part of the Spider-Society Resistance at the very end of the film, with Penny Parker, of course, getting a new Spider-Mech that has a much closer resemblance to the mech from her first appearance in 2014's Edge of the Spider-Verse number 5. And they are of course joined by newcomers Spider-Man India, Spider-Bite, and the instigator of the hour, Spider-Punk, who is the reason why this army assembled in the first place. And together they all hope to rescue Miles Morales from Earth-42, an Earth that was robbed of their Spider-Man, because Alchemax sent that spider to Earth-1610. After Miguel's go-home machine sent Miles to Earth-42, after that machine locked onto the Earth-42 spider DNA in Miles' blood, Miles meets Earth-42 Uncle Aaron, along with his nephew, Miles G. Morales, this universe's newest iteration of the Prowler, following in the footsteps of Uncle Aaron. You can actually see the back of Miles G. Morales' head at the beginning of the film as he sits in class, almost about to be bitten by the radioactive spider of Earth-42, as Spot reveals the spider's origin to Miles. According to director Justin K. Thompson, it is because Miles Gonzalo Morales was never bit and became a superhero that the Sinister Six of Earth-42 have completely corrupted and taken over society, then forcing Uncle Aaron and Miles G. Morales to become hardened heroes as they fight for the innocent of their New York City like Robin Hood type prowlers. So the start of Beyond the Spider-Verse will likely see Earth-1610 Miles Morales team up with both Miles G. Morales and Aaron Davis Prowlers to address some of that crime together. But anyways, that is it for this breakdown of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. These animated films are literally second to none, so I want to thank Mr. Paul Spoilers once again for giving me the opportunity to break this film down for all of you today. You're an awesome man, Paul, and I love you very much. And if you want even more Marvel insight and research from my goofy brown ass, subscribe to youtube.com slash mastertainment today, or you can follow me at mastertainment on Twitter or Instagram or wherever I am on the internet because that is my name. <laughs> But most importantly, do not forget to subscribe to Heavy Spoilers right now. Paul is always cranking up some high quality content and you do not want to miss a single second of it. So when you hit subscribe, make sure you hit that bell so you can get all the notifications every time Paul uploads a video. Don't you miss out now, hit that bell. But again, thank you guys so much for watching this video. I love you guys so much. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.